I've got straight up 9 o'clock, and uh, I believe that will uh, agree with Laura's iPhone, so I think we can go ahead and get started this morning. Um, he is risen. He is risen indeed. That's your rehearsal, because I have an idea you're going to see that in the, in the next service as well. So now you've, now you've been appropriately practiced. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we will uh, see what the scripture has to reveal to us today. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that he is risen. We thank you that your son, in submission to your will, offered himself as a sacrifice for us that we could come into a relationship with you. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for your omnipotence. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for the written word that you have preserved for us. Um, may we study it. May we, in the power of the Holy Spirit, apply it to our lives as light into a dark world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning when I woke up, I do as I usually do, and that is I try to catch up on the very briefest amount of news uh, that uh, I can uh, stomach, and um, I was, uh, uh, came across something posted this morning from a very prominent political pundit that I usually try to stay away from those things in the morning because it does seem to alter my attitude in a way that is not necessarily pleasing, but this prominent political pundit posted this this morning. Christianity is under attack in America. In the 1980s, we would have said, no, duh, okay? And even more prominently, uh, based on some of the uh, proclamations that have come out of our own nation's capital recently, that we should neither be surprised uh, with, nor should we be particularly agitated by, because we know the end of the story, but that was not the end of the um, posting by this pundit. Christianity is under attack in America. The second point, do not let the forces of evil prevail over God. Okay, okay. While I understand the sentiment, this person fundamentally misunderstands what we celebrate today. What is standing on my right and on my left and resurrection Sunday morning. It is finished. We not only know the end of the story, we know the epilogue. It's all right here for us. It is our blessed assurance. So in preparing today's lesson, I had two choices. I could continue with 1 Thessalonians and just keep running through. That was my original inclination. Uh, after today, you probably will say, it should have been your only inclination. But um, I decided to uh, take a week's departure and uh, do something a little more thematically for Easter Resurrection Sunday. And in studying a little bit, it, it, I, I found that there's this debate I didn't even know existed between what is more important, the crucifixion or the resurrection? I never even pondered that. Have you? Is that so? I've never, I, but it's a big theological debate. I'd never even thought about it. But when I was forced to think about it, reading it, this song kept going over in my head. And it's a Frank Sinatra song from the 1950s. Um, the only reason I know about this song was that it was the theme song of a comedy, television comedy, called Married with Children. And the song is Love and Marriage. Y'all remember that one? Some of y'all, some of y'all, some of y'all might have danced to that at your prom. That's the one, Dad! Goes together like a horse and carriage. And then it says, you can't have one without the other. The crucifixion and the resurrection are the apex, the apex of eternity. So we were going to look at a, a theme today uh, that deals with the concept of trees. How am I going to make that turn? Well, let's see here. 
Anybody here like pecan pie? There you go. If you don't like pecan pie, you can be excused. Pecan pie. How about pecan cobbler? Pecan sandies. Okay. How about arugula salad? Yeah, I didn't see many hands go up on that one. But I will tell you, pecans redeem the concept of salad when used, when used appropriately. Now, my father is on record. He despises pecan trees. See? He has a antagonistic relationship with pecan trees, which has always been somewhat amusing to me because he lives in pecan plantation. That's not exactly misleading advertising, okay? So we're going to start today in Genesis 2, and we're going to end in Revelation 22. Hope you brought your track shoes. Genesis 2.9 says this, Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. Y'all have already been on record that pecans are good eaten. So, we can suppose here that the Lord God caused the pecan trees to grow. My father would think they come from a different source, but that is not true. They come from the Lord God of creation. But the verse goes on to say, The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now there are many tree types identified in scripture. Some commentators identify as many as 36 types. Let's look at a few of them. You have the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We just saw that. How about the broom tree? Remember what the broom tree did? That sheltered Elijah, okay, when he was running from, from, from Jezebel. One of my favorite stories is the mighty oak tree from which Absalom and his Fabio-like hair got hung, okay, the cedars of Lebanon, the symbols of prestige and power used by Solomon. The acacia tree. What was the acacia tree used for? What was the wood of the acacia tree used for? Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. The fig tree, which is prominently featured in parables and in other places as the symbol of bearing fruit. The olive tree. The olive tree with its graph, which illustrates God's redemptive plan, not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. You find that in Romans chapter 11. The sycamore tree, of which we little Zacchaeus climbed up in to see the Christ. And i got to tell you, I have two sycamore trees. And I've said this before here. You better be a wee little man, because those limbs are very, very brittle. But then you have the most famous tree of all. The most famous tree of all. Some people wear it around their necks. It's featured prominently on logos of churches everywhere. And there's examples to my left and my right. And that is the cross of Calvary. We're going to look at trees today. And you say, well, what has the tree got to do with the cross? And in Acts 5, chapter, or Acts 5.30, Peter, who is standing before the council of San, the Sanhedrins and the Pharisees, being questioned by the high priest, says this in my translation. I teach out of the New American Standard, 1995. So I'll back up to, to Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. Now, some of you study from different translations, okay? The New King James Version says this, but Peter and the other apostles answered him and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree, okay? The translation is cross equals tree. Young's literal translation says, and the God of our fathers did raise up Jesus, whom ye slew, having hanged upon a tree. There's only one translation out of 30 that I looked at that actually translates that word something different than tree and cross interchangeably. And that one uses the word pole, okay, which I think harkens back to uh, the fiery serpent 
uh, circumstance in the wilderness. But this, this correlation between cross and tree is also in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 13. The, the word is translated interchangeably. So now we're going to play a little word or thematic association here. Because one of, the, one of, the, one of my memories of, of Easter, uh, Easter services, was the songs that we sang, the hymns that we sang. And you're going to get to sing a few uh, here, in, here in a few moments. But I just had this thought this week that I, I needed to look up some of the words to the, to the kind of the prominent Easter songs. And all of these deal with the cross, but the word association I want you to think of is they all deal with the cross. They all deal with Christ's provisional sacrifice, but there's something else thematically that accompanies it every single time. See if you can pick up on it. We'll start with there is a fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Okay, Dealing with the cross, and there's another theme developed here. How about the old rugged cross? On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. And then there's, here's another one, at the cross. Was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. So these all deal with the sacrifice. These all deal with the crucifix. They all deal with, with, with the cross. But do you see something else in there every single time? What's that? You, well, yeah, it's very, very, it, it, it's personal. And yeah, it's directed individually because that's how we come to a saving knowledge of Christ is as, as individuals, not as in cohorts. I'm going to give you a couple of more. I stand amazed in the presence. Okay, this is verse 4, something you probably never sang. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Provision for man, for sure, but the provision for man, why? It's in there every single time. Sin. Sin. And I have a theory. You can choose to accept it or not. It's merely a theory. I think that one of the reasons our churches have gone away from singing these great hymns is because they want to avoid the word sin. But when you avoid the word sin, you're avoiding that. That's why Christ was crucified. But I'm, this is not an assault on contemporary worship songs, because I'm going to give you one here. How about, here am I to worship? I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So we do have examples okay, of contemporary worship songs that bring this concept in. You're going to sing another one today. Okay? Here in the power of Christ I stand. We we're going to sing that later today. And you will see in there the phrase sin and curse is in there. We do not avoid the concept of sin, the reality of sin, when it comes to Easter Sunday morning. The last song I'll share is one by Fanny Crosby. Jesus, keep me near the cross. You know this one? Jesus, keep me near the cross. There is a precious fountain free to all. A healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Fanny Crosby, Jesus, keep me near the cross. I am somewhat convinced that if Fanny Crosby was writing hymns in Paul's day, he would have said, bring that hymnal into every church that I teach in, especially the ones in the province of Galatia. Because she points out a healing stream, free but precious. See that? It's free, but it's precious. Something that is precious has cost. It has worth. 
But this is juxtaposition. It is free, and there's a market for it. It is free to all, free to all, and it has a location. And she says it right here, flows from Calvary's mountain. That's where this healing stream is located. It's, it's, it's headwater. The destination for us that partake in this healing stream is beyond the river, and the ambition is rest, peace with God, no tears, no sorrow, no pain, forever. That's the ambition. Now, there's something in that song, though, that our modern society would, would recoil from, and that is the word healing. Because when the, the word healing is, is presented, what does that imply, necessarily? That there is sickness. That there is sickness. And with all deference to, to some ancient uh, medical uh, 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 th thinkers, the concept of patient heal thyself, Okay, When it comes to the healing for your eternal destination and your destiny, we can't do it ourselves. We can't do it in part. We can't do it in full. We are fully incapable. We are fatally flawed. And that's why we have the cross. And this is the gospel. It is an audacious, redemptive plan of God to reach out and bring the condemned, the cursed, to him for eternity. And it culminated at Calvary and at Joseph's tomb. That's where it all pointed to in the Old Testament. That's where it all points back to in the New Testament. So let's take a moment. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture that we won't do a lot of exposition on because we don't have time. But I think it is a wonderful passage of Scripture that should provide an immense amount of encouragement to us as Christians. And it's from the book of Galatians, Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia, okay, where he identifies a problem. Okay, Unlike what we were seeing so far in the book of 1 Thessalonians, the, book, the, the, book, or the, the, the letter to the Galatia is direct and pointed and um, pointed directly at a specific type of heresy that had infected that, 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 that region. Okay? Galatians 1 6 says exactly what the problem is. I am amazed, Paul says, that you are so quickly deserting him. That's capital H. Deserting, you can read that as Jesus, who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. A different gospel. That's the problem. And it comes up real quick, identified in the letter to the Galatians. See, in the churches at Galatia, you had Judaizers, okay, who were insisting that Christians live under the restrictive tenets of the Mosaic law, okay? They actually had an order of operation for salvation sanctification, and that was this. First thing you had to do is convert to Judaism. You had to convert to Judaism, even by way of an outward sign, which is circumcision, okay? Then you can become the Christian. Okay, then you become the good. So you convert to Judaism, circumcise, you become a Christian, and you sustain that position by keeping the Mosaic law. Their position was, the, the, her, the heretical position was, divine grace and human effort brought righteous standing before God. That a mixture, some amalgam of faith and works was required to retain this righteous standing with God. That had infected the churches at Galatia. And I will tell you, it affects the churches in Hood County, in Texas, in the United States, and across the globe. Because there is a visceral denial of the doctrine of sola gratia, grace alone. Grace alone, the totality of our salvation is a gift of grace from God purchased right there on that tree at Calvary. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That is about as clear as it gets. For by grace have you been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works. But the passage of Ephesians 2 begins with this phrase, and you were dead, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. Not mostly dead, like Princess Bride. Not partially dead, like that movie Flatliners that was on uh, our, uh, our television um, uh, earlier this week, the one with Kiefer Sutherland and, and Julia Roberts and Kevin Bacon and one of the Baldwins. Don't know which one. There's a bunch of them where they, I guess, thought they were dead for a period of time, only to be resuscitated. No, fully dead. Montgomery Gentry song, gone. Dead, dead. All dead. 100% dead. So this denial of grace alone was causing great problems in the churches of Galatia. Enough so that Paul found himself having to present an argument for grace alone. And he does, he does this, and we're going to look at this in chapter 3. And let me tell you, when you get into a debate with the Apostle Paul, he isn't just going to win the argument on the basis of doctrine. He is going to neuter any potential objection you might have in the future. Because this is a brutal beatdown that he gives to this heresy of adding works to faith. And it starts in Galatians 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? <laughs> this is not exactly Mark Antony's speech, you know, in Julius Caesar. Friends, Romans, countrymen. I'm about to give you the most ironic speech of Shakespeare's soliloquies. No, he comes straight at him. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I am actually thinking about using something similar to open my next Zoom meeting this week. So I will be spending the remainder of the day polishing a resume on LinkedIn. But um, when he says you foolish Galatians, he's not calling them stupid. He's not calling them out for a lack of intellect. What he is saying to them is that they have a complete lack of discernment about Bible doctrine, about the teaching, about the truth. So you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now the picture here is that of literally a billboard, a public notice. It is apparent. Jesus Christ was crucified crucified, made all dead, completely dead. That was the sacrifice. The teaching is clear and plain. He's telling them, you have allowed it to become adulterated, contaminated with a concept that has no place. Colossians 2.15 says this, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgression, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, the curse, which was hostile to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it on the tree. He nailed it on the tree. When he had this, verse 15 is an, just a great verse to hold on to, Colossians 2. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. See what Paul is saying here in Galatians? Jesus Christ was publicly crucified. And you think that that was a public display of loss, but it is not. It is a billboard of triumph of the redemptive plan for mankind. Verse 2 of Galatians 3 says, this is the only thing I want to find out for you. Now, <laughs> when, when you're in a debate or an argument and you have someone say to you, this is the 
only thing I want to find out from you. Watch out. Watch out. Because the person who's asking you that question, if they're skilled at all, if they're knowledgeable at all, already knows the answer. Okay? So usually, by the time someone asks you, this is the only thing I want to find out from you, you've already lost. And so what does he say? Did you receive the Spirit? In other words, did you receive salvation? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? That's the only thing he wants to know. And now you've got an answer. You've got to answer it. It's binary. It's binary. And it is clear here that Paul is actually talking to who he believes to be authentic Christians. He assumes that they have received the Spirit, and if the only people that receive the Spirit are those that believe Christ, trust in Christ. And then he goes on. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? So he answers their own question for them. You were begun by the Spirit. Okay? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Is the Spirit, in other words, incapable of sanctification? You get started by the Spirit, and now you have to jettison it and do, do your own thing, choose your own path, re, re, you know, re, uh, rely on your own competencies. Did you suffer so many things in vain, he says in verse 4, if indeed it was in vain? So then does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? In other words, you can't have it both ways. It's by works or by faith. And then his brutal assault to them, because these are Judaizers that he's talking to here, um, he goes back to their own heritage in verse 6. Even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And we could stop right there. We could stop right there. It was accounted to him. It was reckoned to him. What was reckoned to him? Righteousness. By whom? God. Source? God. Control, God, gift, God, it's right there. Reckon to him as righteousness. Righteousness is the, is the desirable outcome here. Justification, standing right before God, guiltless, sinless, that is the objective. Verse 10, we'll skip to verse 10. For as many are as the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not, Abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Okay. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Okay. All things. 100% of things. 100% of time. Cursed is everyone who doesn't uphold that. You want to put your righteousness now up against the standard? No. He's saying no. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, because we have all sinned, we have all fallen short, we have all missed the mark. He quotes in, 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 in verse 11 from uh, the book of Habakkuk, a fellow who knows a lot about what it means to live in an unjust society. The righteous man shall live by faith. That's a quotation from Habakkuk. Verse 12. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. The outcome of the law is to show our complete insufficiency. Okay? The law, unlike what some people say, is, is holy. It, it is actually proclaimed many times by holy angels. Okay? But the curse of the law is when we break the law, and we all break the law. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us. Now that word redeem is literally to purchase out of slavery. We were a slave to the law, and the curse of the law that comes upon you when you, when you uh, violate it, which we all do. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That's tough stuff. See, I think sometimes when we, when, we, when we look at the cross, when we think about the cross, we think about the pain and the suffering, and that is absolutely a part of the, the whole ordeal. But he became a curse. 
the Son of God became a curse for someone. For who? For us. It says it right there. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. See that in a minute. In order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The law brings a curse. It's not a curse in and of itself. Okay, It is a very heavy burden, a burden that we cannot bear. No human has borne it except for one, fully God, fully human Jesus of Nazareth. If we were to follow it completely and without exception, it wouldn't bring evil down on us, but that's really a moot point because we can't. We don't. We have all breached it. We have all breached it. And I dare say we continue to breach it. Okay? And that's why we have the provision of 1 John 1, 9, where we can confess our sins. And, Christ, and Jesus, uh, God says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's implications here for this curse. The non-believer, implications for the non-believer, who says, I've got no need for a Savior. I'm okay. You're okay. We're okay. I've got no need for a Savior. I'm just living this string out. I'm a pretty good person. Might say, I'm not perfect. Not perfect, but I'm good enough. I've got 37% goodness, and I only needed 35%. I need saving, the non-believer might say but I can do that myself. I can figure this pathway out. Or the one that says, I need saving, and I realize that, and there are many pathways to salvation. Let me choose from my cafeteria plan of salvation pathways. Don't bother me with the truth. Under those four implications for the non-believer, all remain under something, and that is the curse. That is the curse. But there's implications for us believers as well, okay? I am saved, but I'm living like I'm trying to purchase something that has already been purchased. That leads to a non-powerful life. That leads to doubt. And our adversary would like nothing more than to have us living impotent lives when it comes to to the, to, the, to the kingdom building process that God would have us involved in. So this whole concept of, of works, okay, really, really complicates the lives of believers. Does this mean that works are bad? No. No. Works, good works, we're, we're, we are born again for good works, okay, that are examples of what our salvation actually is that testify to the authenticity of that salvation. So we should be involved in good works. It's not like we get to sit now on the sidelines and wa you know, watch out the string till the, you know, till the time runs out. When you start feeling like you are insufficient, okay, because I do it all the time, I'm insufficient spiritually, okay? I, could, I, I have let down God. I've let down myself. I've let down my family. Realize this. The book of Galatians is called the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty. The Christian Declaration of Independence. The Charter of Believers' Liberty. Okay? Check out Galatians. And then check out 1 John 1, 9. Because probably what is the problem is that we have unconfessed sin in our life. All we have to do is bring it to the throne of God. Okay? And in contrition, leave it there. And he restores us to that right relationship so that we may begin to live again in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go back to Deuteronomy 21, and we're going to pick up where Paul actually quotes about being cursed by being on a tree. Deuteronomy 21:22 says this, If a man has committed sin worthy of death and is put to death, you hang him on a tree. His corpse shall not be hanged on the tr all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land with which the Lord his God has given you as an inheritance. 
If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang there all night, but you shall surely bury him the same day, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. You see a parallel there to Calvary? Did they let Jesus' body hang on that tree all night? Nope. They took it down. See, this was the, um, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament law given to Israel, if you committed a crime worthy of capital punishment, okay, it's not that you were executed on the tree. That's not what it says. How did they execute? You remember? Stoning. Stoning was the, but after someone was stoned to death, you hung them on the tree as an example, as a warning. Okay? Did it happen in, in old Israel? Yes. There's several examples of it in scripture. Uh, Rashab and Baana and the story of King David, the sin of Peor, recounted in Numbers 25. So yes, but note this, and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree. Not put to death on the tree. The hanging on the tree was there to be a symbol of something. And that symbol was this, accursed of God. Accursed of God. And here Paul says to the Galatians, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now this could be used against Paul, right? Because how on earth is Christ Jesus cursed? It's because he took the curse on himself. He took our birthright, the curse. That's what we should have. And he took it onto himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 makes this perfectly clear. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He took our curse, nailed it right there, buried it, and then is resurrected because his divinity could not, divinity could not be held by death. See, in our concept of jurisprudence, in criminal trials, we have two standards, what are, or two, two outcomes, guilty and not guilty. That is not what we have here. Here we have innocent. Innocent. Blameless. Spotless. Which was the only standard that would work for that provision. It's not just that he is not guilty. It's that Jesus was innocent. And so you go back to the Mosaic Law, and it's talking about this capital punishment. Okay? Someone convicted of a crime. Was Christ convicted of a crime? No. No. He was not convicted of a crime, but he is hanged on that tree for public display. And I would argue that in doing so, as we saw from, from, from uh, one of the other scripture references today, it is a public declaration of triumph. And that's why he says, it is finished. The scripture has been fulfilled. My work here has been done. And I'm coming again. So let's continue with that concept of the tree. And I told you we would go to Revelation. And we're going there now. Last chapter, 22. Then he showed me, this is, this is John being showed. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life. Ah, it's back. Bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Maybe one of them's pecan. I don't know. But it's going to be beautiful. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
Then verse 3, there will no longer be any curse. See, that's, that's your end of the story. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Look at this. And there will, be, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have the need of a light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. There's this tree of life that doesn't need photosynthesis. It has God sustaining it. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned and were thrown out of the garden, the access to that tree of life was taken away, was it not? In fact, put some angels up with some pretty interesting sword work, okay? So the tree of life at that point was cut off, okay, by a merciful God. Because who would want to live forever in this sinful fallen state? That's mercy. But there is coming a time, and it's pointed to right here, when the redeemed will have eternal access, equal access, unfettered access to the tree of life. So trees play a a book-ending role in Scripture. Disobedience and the curse of sin entered through the actions taken uh, relative to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember that? That's how sin entered the world. When creation is reclaimed and made new again, all those who know Christ as their Savior, and I pray that as you, will have equal access to this tree of life that somehow stands on either side of the river. I have some thoughts on that. No time to talk about that today. And in between, at the fulcrum of human history, of the fulcrum of eternity, At the precise right time, salvation came because of the work on that tree there. So trees play an amazing role in Scripture. But Greg, what about the resurrection? You're going to sing about it. You're going to hear children sing about it today. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. You see that? Even though that's not scripture per se, all fear is gone. So if you're living in fear, if you're living in trepidation, if you're living in sorrow, okay, that is not, that is not the mental attitude that is gifted to us through the Holy Spirit. We live in dunamis, in power, in joy, and in blessing. So we bookend it. Trees play an amazing, amazing role. And he rose again, and because he lives and ascended to the right hand of the Father, okay, he's interceding for us. He's interceding for us. There is no accusation that can reach us. Our ledger has been clean because he nailed it right there, buried it, and rose again. I want you to think about this. Paul is writing to uh, folks in the ancient world, Greeks and Romans, as well as, as well as the Jews. Okay? Can you name another God who would send his son an equal part of himself to condescend to die for his creation? Would Zeus do that? Would Apollo do that? No. Think about how it turns all human endeavor on its head. It is not by works. It is not by what we can conjure up in our mind. It is not on what we feel. It is a fact. It is a fact. God sent his son to die for us, and he rose again, and we celebrate it We should celebrate it every day and live in the power, but we definitely celebrate it today on Resurrection Sunday morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. Don't don't understand, can't calculate the amount of love you must have for us. 
to have condescended to bring your son, send your son here to die for us. The fact that you threw our curse on him, all of us deserve eternal separation. And we know that he suffered. We know that he bled. But my God, the curse that he took upon himself, Lord. We thank you that he was able to declare in your power it is finished. We are sorry for the times that we fail you where our devotion to you is insufficient. Please keep us in the right relationship and the power of the Holy Spirit so that the works that you have commissioned us to do are, are, are done out of love for you out of devotion to your redemptive plan for mankind and not out of some type of motivation of fear or a motivation thinking we can earn something. Lord, we look forward to the time where we are with you in eternity and the 12 fruits of the tree of life are there for us throughout eternity. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.